We are committed to helping individuals break cycles. We are delighted that you have taken the opportunity to join us. So prepare yourselves for this week's teaching and equipping session. Get ready to be educated, equipped, and set free as you listen to this week's broadcast. And thank you for joining us. Hello. My sound is messed up still. I can hear you. Can you all hear me? You can hear me okay? All right. Yes. All right uh, then. Yvonne, Sister Steele, can you hear me okay? Because I can't hear you all. I cannot hear you guys. But we, as long as you can hear me, we're going to go ahead and get started. Is that all right? Great. Thank you so very much. We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Thank you all so very, very much for joining us today. Let me get rid of this. I'm going to try to get rid of that. There we go. I am Deborah Edwards here with the team, and I have with me tonight Sister Steele, Yvonne Steele, who is the director of our youth ministry, and Sister um, LaShawn, uh, who is also with us tonight, and she is going to uh, follow up on a few things that we talked about before. We are so grateful to have all of them. And we, of course, we have Kai behind the cameras. So welcome. Welcome to each and every last one of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are just excited to be here and to continue on with Mama Trauma 3. Tonight, we're going to be discussing healing from abortion. If you have been following us with our sister to sister, you know that uh, we just started out with um, Evan. Angelus Renee, who talked about the trauma that women go through, that mothers go through, who have children that are incarcerated. And then we followed up with LaShawn, who talked to us about um, women who have to now assume the role of mother when being a caregiver. And so we're extremely excited about that. And I don't know what happened to the camera, but I'm going to go back this way. There you go. <laughs> we're extremely excited about that. And so tonight we're dealing with mama trauma, healing from abortion. And so as I begin to continue to think about the diff different things that were traumatic to women, I was thinking about the political arena, actually, and everything that's been going on in the political arena about um, abortion and um uh, if you have had, if you vote for this candidate, then you know you're not a Christian because you believe in abortion and yada yada yada. And so I, I began to think about what if I was the one who had had the abortion, and I was sitting at work and everybody was talking against you know the Democratic Party and if you're a Democrat and you believe in abortion, you're not a Christian, you're going to hell. How would that make me feel? How would that make me feel? Because the one thing about abortions is that you already have your own trauma that you're dealing with. You already have your own issues that you're dealing with. And so the last thing you feel like being uh, being a part of is being judged by people who don't know what happened to you. And also people who don't have the keys to death, hell, or the grave. They don't have either one. And they're not privileged to see the list of who goes to which side of eternity. They're not. But here you are sitting in a room with people who are criticizing not only people that have abortions, but people who believe in abortions. And, um, and so we're going to just talk about the pain and the trauma and uh, what we can do to heal. Because tonight, it doesn't matter if you had an abortion five minutes ago, five days ago, five months ago, five years ago, or 20 years ago. The pain and the suffering and the uh, results of that can last for years. And so we want to talk to you about it because what happens is you begin to grieve. You begin to grieve your actions and sometimes you can uh, begin to self reject. And so I want to start out with a few things. Uh, first of all, there are always going to be people, always going to be people who will criticize you and try to find fault in you. But also there's always going to be God, our father, waiting to heal you in every place that you hurt, ready to heal you in every place that you hurt. 
And so we know that a, a lot of people, now, first of all, let me tell you that we know that we should not you know, that we should trust God. If we do things the way that God wants us to do, then we will not be engaged in premarital sex. And we, you know, when we have babies, we would have them in the perfect world. <laughs> we would have them when we're married and settle and can take care of them. But because of Adam and Eve, there's no longer a perfect world, right? And people are doing whatever they want to do. And sometimes when people have had abortions, they had it because of circumstances, you know, that they know, they, they know about what they were going through, what they were feeling at that time. And a lot of women felt like there was no way out or Maybe the they didn't know who the baby daddy was, or maybe they were raped. There are many, many reasons that cause people to be, uh, to, women to get themselves in a position where they feel like they have to, they have to have an abortion. And so the one thing that is consistent with that is that God knows. And even if um, there was another choice presented and we still chose to have an abortion. Do you know that all we have to do is go to God, our father. That's all we have to do is go to God, our father and talk to him. And he's waiting to heal us in every place that we hurt. And abortion is a process where a pregnancy is forcefully terminated, either for medical reasons, when it poses a threat to the life of the mother or for other reasons, such as an unplanned pregnancy. And so for the introduction for tonight, I just want to say, uh, read this portion. It says abortion is something that all of us are familiar with, either by self-experience, someone we know, or through the uproar in the political arena. A lot of emotions are connected with and experienced by those women who have had abortions. Tonight, we want to address some of the issues and feelings associated with abortions so that those who may need healing or deliverance can begin the process. Because what I want you to know is that, you know, we are dream. We are a deliverance ministry. We are an equipping ministry. And so we deal with a lot of open door issues. We deal with a lot of cycles, familiar spirits and generational curses. And so the thing that we know is that in the onslaught sort of abortion, when that begins to happen, that is an open door that the enemy can come in. You know, he can come in just like he can come in when, when you're pregnant. If you're going to carry um, uh, your baby full term, sometimes the enemy attaches itself to then, to, to your baby then by some form of emotion or trauma that you're going through. You know, it could, it's external, of course, but when you start internalizing that, that's uh, external going on and you're pregnant, it can affect your baby. And so the same would be an open door if you're having an abortion. And so there can be a murdering spirit attached to, to you because of that. What do I mean? There's a spirit that will come and torment you and um, harass you. And it will try to cause death in every area of your life. That's what I mean by a murdering spirit, whether it's murdering, murder, murdering your dreams, your hopes, your ambitions, your desires, is coming to do what the Bible tells us that Satan came to do, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so most women experience this tormenting spirit, you know, when they're trying to decide, what do I do? You know, is it adoption? Or do I try to raise this child on my own? Or do I just go ahead and have an abortion and just try to forget about it? And I'm just going to try to forget about it. And so I don't know too many women who were successful at, I'm just going to forget about it. I'm just going to have an abortion and I'm just going to forget about it. And so what happens is when that occurs, you start feeling a lot of things like guilt. And when we talk about guilt, guilt can be defined as a feeling of responsibility or remorse for some offense, crime, or wrong, whether it was real or imagined. Because after, after the abortion, you begin to second guess yourself and, and think, did I do the right thing? And then there are triggers. You know, there are triggers, whether it's somebody else having a baby or whether it's, uh, you know, you get pregnant again sometimes down the road. There are many triggers that can cause your mental state to change. Uh, what you believe in and what you're doing, it can cause it to change. So that is my introduction. And uh, we're going to continue. But first, want to uh, turn it over to LaShawn and Yvonne for them to give their introduction for tonight. So we'll switch it over to one of these young ladies. I can't hear either one of them right now. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can't hear you. 
Kim, are they able to hear me? Guys, I'm going to ask you to bear with us. Okay, yes, they can hear you me. You can still I am... hear me. I can't hear LaShawn. Uh, Kim is stating that they can hear me. My name is LaShawn Aiden, and I work with the, uh, I'll cover the marriage ministry with my husband. Did that already. And um, as Deborah said earlier, I talked about trauma in regards to my mother. Um, being a caregiver for her because she has Alzheimer's now. And so um, the position that it put me in as taking care of my mother as opposed to my mother taking care of me. Or um, having to be in that, that position of, of being her caretaker and um, doing all things for her because she can do nothing for herself, just like um, you would a child. Um, but one thing in regards to abortion, when I was younger, uh, my mother told me that she was going to get an abortion when she was pregnant with me, but she did not. And um, people would often ask me when I've made that statement, uh, well, how do you feel? Did that make you angry? And I'm like, well, no. Um, it didn't make me angry. It really didn't make me feel any kind of way because I'm here. Um, and I think part of it that I didn't, I didn't feel any type of angst or anything towards my mother because my mother was only 14. So thinking about now being at the age of 14, even, you know, back then, it wouldn't surprise me, but that that would be an option. So it did not bother me. The fact that she told me that, um, and I discussed it with her. It, it didn't make me feel like, oh, my God, I couldn't believe you would even think that. But I thought, here's a child having a child. So, um, you know, I didn't feel as though she was trying to get rid of me or this, that, and the other. But I'm sure there were plenty of thoughts going through her mind as such a young child having a child. And I know that was traumatic for her. And so I believe part of that trauma of her being pregnant at such a young age, uh, wondering, you know, whether or not, you know, she would have an abortion, would she keep me, would she put me up for adoption, uh, weighed on her. And I think that that had a direct effect on um, me because I think all of that going on with her affected me in, in the womb and um, really started the, the issue with me and wondering about my identity as I got older. And I never put that correlation together until I actually uh, started uh, dealing with deliverance, working in deliverance, going through deliverance. I didn't put that correlation together. But as Deborah said, oftentimes the enemy comes in very early. He will come in during the womb. So all those things that my mother experienced, I experienced. I just did not connect it until I got older. So um, there are different, even if, like she said, even if you had never had an abortion, um, you can still have um, some form of tie to that um, with me. In the case of my mother, the fact that she thought about it and that worried her enough um, while I was, she was pregnant with me and the conversation we had about it um, I think that touched on, on, on quite a few things in regards to me and as I grew older and then also as I became a mother and just the thought of, you know, should I have an abortion when I had, you know, was pregnant with my first child because I was not married and, you know, the thought entered my mind. Um, but I decided, no, that's not something I'm going to do. I'm going to have my child, um, but I do believe that it really affected me just the thought of her going back and forth on what she should do because between my grandmother and my great grandmother, they were really, you know, making the decision, not my mother, because she was really just a child. So you can experience trauma um, in so many different ways, just in regards to this subject it, itself. And like Deborah said, you know, no one has the key to death, hell, and the grave, but Jesus. But until we understand and we know deliverance, um, we, we, we can't connect those dots. We can't um, put our mindset to where, you know, what, what people are saying and even what people are doing has no correlation to my salvation. That's only what God can do. 
And so now I need to focus on my relationship with him and what he has for my life and not allow the outside forces to mold me and to shape me into the person that I should be or they think I should be, but only what God has for me and what God says about me. Right, right. And, and I think too, um, there is a stigma with that as, as with so many other things because the world is quick to put a stigma or um, some type of label on you. But until you know who you are in Christ, you'll take on that label and it'll just be adding, um, you know, full fuel to the fire. You know, here's another stick of wood to set that fire blaze. Here's another stick of wood until you can eventually explode or even implode. But I think the key is really learning who you are in Christ, learning who you are yes, in Christ. Right. So whatever happened, to you or didn't happen to you in regards to abortion, he's Christ is the only one that can help you through that. He's the only one that can really steer you toward who you are and what's your purpose to be. And I know Yvonne, you probably, you know, can really attest to this as far as, you know, you dealing with families and you dealing with young children. So you may come across a lot of women who've had abortions, who thought about abortions, who, um, have been affected in so many different ways in regards to abortion. And you can see how it can really affect the child when they not know that that's what's really affecting them. Oh yeah. Um, because the mother passes that on. Like I said before, I didn't realize that I had, you know, where my identity issues stemmed from until I went through um, deliverance because it was like, like I said, my great grandmother and my grandmother were like, ones, okay, she's going to have abortion and she's going to put this child up for adoption. She's going to keep this kid. Well, who's going to raise this kid? So, you know, what are we going to do with it? W what are we going to do? And, you know, that was the open door for the enemy to come in and have me question my identity about who I am or even am I worthy? But once again, everyone needs to go through yeah. deliverance. Everyone needs a form of deliverance because we all have some form of bondage. We, we're all in some form of bondage. We all have some form of baggage that we carry. And, you know, we have to get well past that what goes on in this house stays in this house because we have to reveal some things so that we can be healed from them and understand why we act the way we act, why we do the things that we do, why we say the things that we say and stop passing these generational curses on and stop getting an understanding, stop allowing the guilt and the shame to overtake you, to stop you from stepping out into your destiny, being the fullest that God has called you to be. Cause we can all walk around here like zombies going through the motions. You know, I have to do A, B and C. This is Monday. I do C, D and E. This is Tuesday. I do E, F, G, you know, that sort of thing going through the motions, but having people in your life who want to pour into you, want to pour into you the word of God, who want to pour into you about your destiny and mm -hmm. who want to let you know that help is available because oftentimes people don't, right. right. They want help. They don't know how to get it or they want help on their own terms. And oftentimes, you know, right. people who won't help on their own terms is because they want to control the help. Mm -hmm. They want to control right. how much they give up or how much they keep. And with women being nurturers, we're carriers, so we can carry a whole lot. Absolutely, Sometimes we think yeah. we can carry the world when in actuality we can't. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have to be able to be vulnerable and transparent enough to say that I need help because we were meant for community. We were meant for unity. Mm -hmm. right. I think you know, that um, I think that we hey, touch bases with that in the beginning with the first mama trauma about how you're so busy caring for other people that you don't realize that you have been traumatized yourself from the actual care, from the actual thing that you said, I'm doing because I love this person. I'm supposed to do this as a mother. I'm supposed to do this as a wife. I'm supposed to do this as a daughter. I'm supposed to do this as an aunt. And you don't realize the, the uh, tear 
and the that's taking place on on the inside of you like pieces of yourself are being torn away your identity is mm -hmm. being lost in your caregiving and you don't see that as something harmful because you're doing it out of love but eventually mm -hmm. when it begins to tear at you so much you lose the grace to do it and mm -hmm. um, when we lose the grace as caregivers, that's when we begin to lash out and we begin to be angry. And we have these bouts where we cry or where these bouts where we say, you know what, I'm just going to check out. I had a young lady tell me one time, she said, you know what, Miss Debbie, I was thinking about killing myself. And I said, why? She said, because when people are dead, they look peaceful. She said, and I just need some peace mm -hmm. right now. You know, she said, they just look peaceful. And that's how the enemy can come in, in your mind with all of these suggestive thoughts and everything to make you think, just check out. You know, th there's a reason that there is an increase in suicide with young children now, because they don't know how to fully articulate their feelings. And they've been bullied so much that even when they're at home, they're being bullied spiritually. And that's why they can't mm -hmm. effectively communicate with their with their mothers or their caregivers that I'm in trouble. And so those tormenting spirits will say, just go ahead and kill yourself. And so we talked about that overwhelming sense of there is no way out. There is no way out. And so trauma, whether it is through the act of an abortion or whether it's through caregiving or whatever, the results are the same if you don't have any support. And the culprit is the same. You know, it, it is the same enemy that's coming to steal, kill, and destroy, mm -hmm. you know, whether, no matter how he's trying to bring trauma, because the emotion happens first. The trauma happens first. And as we covered this in our last in our last two um, segments on mama trauma, the emotion happens first. And when you don't properly heal from that or get the help that you need, that's when you start seeing demonic influence because the enemy is going around seeking whom he can devour. So he's looking for those open places in your emotions. He's looking for those open places in your soul. He's trying to find a way in. And when we don't don't trust God all the way when we don't have a relationship mm -hmm. with God then it's easy for the enemy to come in at that time very easy for him to come in at that time and therefore you will see that there are a lot of uh, deliverance ministries being raised up because God wants his people free you know, right. in, ev in every command that Jesus gave the disciples, deliverance was a part of that. But unfortunately, we have so many pastors that stray away from that, even though it is in part of the Great Commission. You know, he sent the, the, the disciples out to do what? You know, they were supposed to heal. They were supposed to pray and, 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 and go for souls and they were supposed uh -huh. to deliver. He was so so adamant about this that when the disciples said, teach us how to pray, he added, deliver us from evil. And there are many ways to do that, but it was on his heart. Look, you, you need some help. You need some help. You're not going to be able to battle the enemy by yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. You need some help. Even the disciples needed help. Remember when the, the father bought his son and um, the, those spirits were tearing at him? And he said, I took him to your disciples first, but they couldn't do anything. He said, so can you help me? And so sometimes our level and experiences, you know, may not always be on this. We may not always be on the same level with our experiences, but there's going to be always God is always going to have somebody there that we can turn to that. We can say, listen, I need a little bit more help. I, I depend on these women. I depend on them a lot. Now, I know that, you know, my role in their life, because all of them are, are prophetic and they all um bring my camera down. Okay. They're, they're all prophetic and they're all seers. Okay. And so my role was to teach them how to maximize the gift that God had given them. But I still have to go to them sometimes and say, listen, I saw this or I dreamt this. What do you think about that? Because I truly believe that iron sharpened iron. Some people think that when you are the pastor or the apostle or the lead person, then you're always supposed to be teaching. I had somebody say, you know, these, these women need to be sitting at your feet. And I said, then that would make me kind of stupid. If they got to sit at my feet for 20 years, when do they go out? Because that means that I'm not doing my job. My job is to equip them so that they multiply in the earth and they continue to go different directions so that they can um, 
uh, do the work of the ministry. They can do the, uh, the great commission. They can fulfill the great commission. If I've always got somebody sitting at my feet, then that's an indictment against my ability to train and to equip and to teach. So we're mm -hmm. going to, did you want to say something, Yvonne? Then I'm going to um, get back to, um, we talked about guilt, some of the things that are associated with um, when you have the abortion. Psychology Today states that guilt is um, like shame. Uh, it's embarrassment or your pride has been described as a self-conscious emotion involving reflection on oneself. You begin to look at your actions. And sometimes, even though you think that your actions are critical and what you went through, you don't, you don't have the power to change on your own. You don't, you don't have the resources or the tools mm -hmm. to walk through forgiveness. And oftentimes forgiving yourself is the hardest thing to do. You know, it's easier sometimes to forgive other people, but trying to forgive yourself can be so hard at times. And so you need just a little bit of help to do that. And so the other thing, uh, when I looked at uh, Wikipedia, it states that guilt is an emotional experience that occurs when a person believes or realizes, whether it's accurately or not, that they have compromised their own standards of conduct or have violated universal moral standards and bear significant responsibility for that violation. And I just assumed that a lot of women were experiencing this over the course of the last four or five years as uh, abortions has been really the center conversation in the political arena. And we want you to know that no matter what you have heard, uh, no matter how many views or opinions people have, there is still healing and deliverance mm -hmm. for you. And you want that healing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you you want to you mm -hmm. want to repent. Yes, God loves you, and yes, He wants to restore you. But there is a need to repent. There is a need to repent Absolutely. because, like the Bible says, we perish what because of their of a lack of knowledge. And so maybe at the time of the abortion, you did not have enough information to make the right decision at that time. Well, get this: God is not going to hold that against you if you repent. You just got to go mm -hmm. to him and say, God, and, and maybe you did have enough uh, information, but where you were mentally and spiritually did not afford you the opportunity to say, Lord, there's got to be something better. There's got to be something different, Lord. What do I need? You might not have even known to call on him, but now you do. You didn't know to call on him. You didn't know that he was faithful and true. Mm -hmm. You didn't know how much he loved you and that he still had a plan and a purpose for your life. You didn't know that. But tonight we are My. here to let you know that he loves you and that you did not catch him off guard. You did not surprise him by your actions. Yes, they might have made him sad, but he is in the restoration business. You know, the whole ministry of Jesus was what? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. If you remember the thief on the cross, he did not have time to go back and prove that he was sincere right. about turning to Jesus. Mm -hmm. He said, listen, I believe who you say you are. I believe who you say you are. And today, you know, I want to be with you. And he said, you're going to be with me today in paradise. You know, today you can experience the grace of God and the mercy of God right here, oh, right oh. here. You know, we know people who were failed attempts of abortions, that their parents did try to abort them, but it didn't work. It did not work. Her, heard a story actually yesterday where uh, the lady was going somewhere and the Holy Spirit told her, I need you to go into this room. And she was like, go into this room? Why I got to go in this room? Because I'm going down this way. He said, no, go into this room. And she went into the room and she stood there and she heard a noise like a rat moving. And and uh, the person shared the story said, you know how most women are. They think there's a rat in that room. They're out. <laughs> She said, but she was so sure that the Holy Spirit told her to go in the room that she stood there. And then she noticed that the noise was coming from the trash can. And she said, OK, I know what God said. And so I'm thinking I'm not going to put my hand in that trash can. <laughs> I'm going to get a broom or a stick or something and I'm going to shake it. But she began to take all the trash with her hand out of the trash can and found the two week old baby girl. Now, 
some parent had felt like they couldn't do it, that they could not take care of this baby. And this was the best thing that they could do, that maybe the baby would die before somebody realized the baby was in there and the baby would be just thrown out with the trash. But God had a purpose and a plan for that baby. And that baby is three years old now, healthy and happy and living life. And so what am I trying to tell you? You said, but Deborah, I had an abortion. Okay, you had an abortion. Well, I still believe that that was a living soul and that Mm -hmm. that baby got a chance to see Jesus before you did. I believe that, you know, that's Deborah's doctrine. You don't have to believe it. That's that's my own doctrine. That's my own belief. And so what I want you to do is to trust the God that's taking care of the living soul to also trust that he will take care of you. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's so full of grace and mercy. He uh, he wants you to be reconciled. He wants you to be healed, mm-hmm. but he also wants you to take responsibility for your action and then lay it at the cross. Then lay it at the cross. Right. He doesn't want you to walk around feeling uh, shame. Yes, you're, there's some remorse that's going to come, and remorse is a can be a good thing unless you allow it to beat you down so that right. you can't come up, that you feel like you're drowning. He wants you to have remorse enough that you go to repent, not remorse enough that you go to contemplating suicide or or, or turn to drugs or turn to alcohol or turn to prostitution because you want everything inside of you to die. You feel like since you killed the baby, then there's no reason for you to live. There's no reason for you to care about your body anymore. So you just give your body to anybody because you're trying to hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want you to hurt yourself. That's what the blood of Jesus is all about. That's what the finished work of the cross is all about, that you can just take it to him. And so he doesn't want you to feel shame. Shame can be defined as a painful feeling arising from the consciousness of something dishonorable, improper, ridiculous, done by oneself or another to publicly humiliate or shame for being or doing something specifically. And so he doesn't want you to feel shame. He wants you to just come Mm -hmm. to him. And do you remember the story of Abel and Cain? And so he said, I would have received your offering. You know, when I told you that, you know, his offering is better, I didn't mean for you to get mad and just go back. Just go do better. Just go Mm -hmm. do better. You go do better. I'll accept Mm -hmm. it. And so even after an abortion, God is saying, go do better. Go do life better. Mm -hmm. Go do decisions Mm -hmm. better. Go do worship better. Mm -hmm. Go do you better. He said, just go do it better. I'm not going to turn against you, but don't let murder stay in your heart where you go and not only attack others, but you attack yourself. Just go do better. That's what he wants you to do. And that's what we want you to do. Just go do better. Let God heal you in every place that you hurt. When I looked up Wikipedia, it said that shame is a discrete, basic emotion described as a moral or social emotion. And this is the part that made me think about how are the women who have had abortions feeling right now with so much targeting? You've got pastors who are, pastors who are supposed to be shepherds, right? They're supposed mm-hmm. to be shepherds, which means that we're supposed to be able to go to them and get healed. We're supposed to be able to go to them and get healed and say, you know, I had an abortion. But now, you know, with the political uproar that happened, you see pastors who said, if you if you believe in abortion, don't you come to my church? Well, what if you are already a member of that church and you had no idea, no idea that that's how your pastor felt? You thought you could talk Mm -hmm. to him about anything. You thought he was just like God that he was not going to judge you, that he was going to love you and and restore you. And now you're sitting in church and everybody is saying, yes, they're going to hell, they're going to hell, they're going to hell. You've been singing on the praise and worship team. You've been working on the cooking Mm -hmm. ministry. You've been out in the neighborhood with the evangelistic ministry. You've been working in the parking lot. And now all of a sudden, your church going friends and your pastor are telling you you're going to hell. Man, I would love to talk to some of you who have experienced that to see how did you handle that? What does your future look like there at that church? Did you cower down and raise your fist to mm-hmm. 
and say, oh yeah, y'all going to hell, y'all going to hell. Why? It, on the inside, you're saying, I hope they don't notice that it's me. Let me raise my hand too. Let me raise my fist too. Let me yell that they're going to hell, they're going to hell, that they, that they don't know God. Let me do it too. Because if I sit here and cry, I might be identified as somebody that had an abortion. Let me join in. Let me get a protest sign because I don't want to be identified as someone that murdered their child. Let me get a bullhorn. Let me get in the parade. Let me march too because I don't want to be identified right. as somebody that made a wrong choice, somebody that made a bad decision. Well, you know what? Their opinions don't hold up to how God feels about you. It doesn't. It doesn't. And you don't have to stay in that place. You don't have to stay a member of that church. You don't. You don't because you are the church. You are the church. And you can ask God to send you somewhere where you can be you. And that your pain and the choice you mm -hmm. made to have an abortion can turn around to be a testimony to help somebody else. You can begin to be a witness to the pain and the devastation that happens. And you can share that with somebody and maybe they won't make the, the same choices that you made. You can empower them. You can let them know what other options are out there, what other things they can do. That's how you turn your misery into your ministry, by sharing mm -hmm. your story, being unashamed of it. Yes, I did it. Yes, I said it. Wasn't the best decision, but let me talk to you about it. See, a lot of things can happen when you have dialogue. A lot of things can happen mm -hmm. when you have honest communication. A lot of things can happen when you sit around and talk because you never know who is sitting, right. sitting among you that may have experienced that same thing. Years ago, I think it might have been in 2000 or 1999, me and about five other women went to Azusa. And so we paid the extra money to be able to have priority, priority seating. And we booked three hotel rooms, two to a room. When we got to the hotel, and we even had a credit card down on the rooms. When we got to the hotel, they had gave all the rooms away. And because we didn't think we had to rush to get to the hotel because, you know, they got our credit card number. They're going to charge us for one night anyway, right? That's supposed to be how it works. And so we weren't in a rush to get to the hotel. And we got there. They only had one room left. It was six women in that one room because we were so thirsty to get to Azusa. And so I had been around these women for a long time and um, got up to go into the bathroom. And I had a partial at that time. And I got up to go to the bathroom to put my partial in a, in a in the container with water. And there were four other partials sitting on the sink. <laughs> I was like, what? What's going on here? <laughs> I had never known that four of the women did not have their own teeth. And they didn't know that I didn't have mine. See, that's what communication and relationship is like. You find out that you are not so different, that mm -hmm. you're not the only one that's missing a tooth in the front. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That was kind of shocking to me to see all see all those partials in the bathroom. But we were able to laugh about it. So it wasn't this embarrassing thing that could happen. We were able to laugh about it. Like, how long you had yours? What what happened to your tooth? How did you lose that? You know, we were able to talk about it. Sometimes just being in the right setting right. with the right people where there is no judgment mm -hmm. will bring so much healing, so much healing to you. And so as I go back to my notes, I'm going to turn it back over to LaShawn and uh, Yvonne. Well, I, I believe you, you're absolutely right, Deborah, when you said the right atmosphere. And it's 
sometimes it astonishes me today that some people still believe that their circumstance that they're the only ones going through it. And that is so untrue as the word says, there's nothing new under the sun, meaning even the issues that we have is nothing new that they it's happened before it's happening now. And it'll probably happen in the future. But the key is surrounding yourself with the right people, having the courage to step out and say that I need help, um, not hiding or uh, allowing shame to take you so deep that you do nothing or that you even cause some form of harm to yourself. And you can cause harm to yourself without actually attempting to commit suicide or cutting or anything like that. Just holding all those emotions in will affect you physically and it'll affect you mentally. So we need to be able to have people around us, people within our circle who we can confide in and who can, con who can uh, give us wise counsel. And that wise counsel meaning that we're gonna get some counsel that's based on the word of God not somebody's opinion, not the, oh, woe is me, or honey, this is what I would have done, or mm -hmm, yeah, I told you so. We No, that's not what I'm talking about. Truly wise counsel that has your best interest at heart, that does not have ulterior motives, that wants you to succeed, that wants you to be healthy, that wants you to be well. Everyone should be surrounded by um, some counsel of that nature. But Absolutely. so often... People are misled or misguided as, you know, you don't want anybody to know your business. Don't tell anybody your business and you can't get healed because when you go to the doctor, you got to tell your business. Absolutely. You know, how Absolutely. can they truly help you if you don't get all the information? Because they're going to probe you. They're going to ask you a million questions and they're going to have you read a million questions and check off. Yes, no, maybe what have you. Mm -hmm. And it's no difference from when you need deliverance. It's no different from when you need help. You have to lay it out. You have to tell me the full scope of what the issue is in, in order for you to receive the help that you need, the help that we can give you. Absolutely. But we have to be at that place mentally. We have to have a transformed mind and say, you know, I can't continue to live like this. I can't continue to, to do this. And we shouldn't mm -hmm. always have to get to the point where, well, I've done everything else. I might as well, or I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Let's not get to that boiling point. Mm-hmm. Because we know us. Absolutely. And we can't allow other people to talk us out of the help that we need. Oh, well, don't mm -hmm. go over there. Mm -hmm. Well, I did this and I did that. No. What do you need for you? What do you need to be successful? What do you need to, to be set free? What do you need to be liberated? And in all of that, getting you closer in your relationship with Christ so you can walk out what he's purposed for your life. And I always say it, it reminds me of uh, of having a baby. Mm -hmm. After you've been in labor for so long, you don't care who looking, you don't care who walking by, you don't care who see you in what state. Yeah, because if you've been <laughs> in a painful labor for some hours, you don't even care. You don't. Right. When I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, thirty six hours of labor, hour fifteen, I was like, "Hey, that person got on the white coat. Have them come in here. I don't care who it is." <laughs> I can blow this baby out my nose. I want it out. Somebody better come get me. I don't care who you are. And that's how we should be with our freedom when, when we're, we're tied down with these issues. No, I need to be free. Yeah. You know, I want to walk in the fullness of life. This is not the abundant life that Christ talked about because I'm tired all the time. You know, like I said, it affects me physically, mentally. You can't walk. You're grinding your teeth. You're having migraines. Because we're holding all of this in. Absolutely. Because we're feeling that guilt and that shame and that condemnation. And condemnation is only from the enemy. All of that. Absolutely. God doesn't give you com condemnation. He gives you conviction. Not condemnation. We need to get to the point to where, you know, we say, this is what I've done, Lord. I need to repent. I, I need mm -hmm. help. Help me to move on from this. Put somebody in my life because clearly I can't do it. Yeah. Or clearly, you know, I don't know how to do it. Help me, Jesus, and he'll help you. Absolutely. I love what Bridget uh, just put up there. She, uh, even when you go to the doctor, you have to, t they ask you, how many pregnancies have you had? 
how many of those were live births, how many were abortions, how many mm -hmm. miscarriages, because they want to know, because though it not the abortion and the pregnancy, whether it's full term or not, take a toll on your body. Mm -hmm. it, it takes a toll on your body. So before your, your GYN look up in there, she want to know what she needs to be looking for. You know, she wants to see right. if there's anything from those pregnancies, anything from those abortions could be affecting your health now, not just your psychological or spiritual health, but what could be affecting even your natural health now. And so I thank you for putting that up there, Bridget. I love that, um, that statement. And, you know, in, um, psychology today it says as a self-conscious emotion shame informs us of an internal state of inadequacy unworthiness dishonor regret or disconnection you guys hear mm -hmm. that shame is a clear signal there are positive feelings have been interrupted Ooh, I love that one. It yeah, is a good. clear indication that our positive feelings have been interrupted. You know, whether you had the abortion because the guys wanted you to have it, start treating you differently, you already had children, whatever it is, your way of being and your way of living just got interrupted. And so mm -hmm. when you had that abortion, it changed you forever. And depending on your support group at the time, again, I want to say that that became an open door. It is possible that that became an open door. You might not have felt the spiritual um, uh, attack mm -hmm. on, right then and there, but sometimes the enemy will lay dormant so he can attack you later with guilt, with judgment, with shame. And that's why repentance is so important. And so LaShawn mentioned something a few minutes ago. God comes not to condemn us. That's the role of the enemy. God comes to convict us. And if you don't know the difference between the two, you will miss God and you will miss an opportunity to be healed. You will miss an opportunity to be restored. God God says, look, I'm, I want you to feel a degree or a level of remorse. So you come to me saying, God, what must I do to be saved? What Amen. must I do to be saved? You may have to climb up in a tree and say, hey, I heard you were coming by and I was so short in my statue and, and the way that I felt about myself. I was so short in how I, I looked at myself, my identity. And so I didn't compete. I couldn't compete with the people who are righteous and who are holy and who know more scriptures than I do and who know the Bible and who can sing and who can preach. I saw myself as this little man, but there was something inside of me that says, but he's coming this way and I don't want to miss him when he comes this way. Amen. So if I got to climb up in a tree so that he will see me, that's what I'm going to do. And then Amen. maybe he'll come to my house, even though I was the tax collector, even though I took people money, maybe he will pardon my sin. And we know that that particular Bible story, that's exactly what Jesus did. He said, today I'm going to eat at your house. And he came and the guy was so grateful. He said, you know what? I'm going to repay everything, anything that I unjustly. He said, I tried not to be unjust, but if I did, I'm going to repay everything. And see, that's what having a real encounter with Jesus would do. Mm -hmm. It would say, you know what? I'm not going to forget that I did that. But God, if there's a way I can make it up. If there's a way now I can turn a new leaf, I can turn my life around, I can begin to serve mm -hmm. you in a new capacity. God, that's what I want to do. And that's what God wants to do for some of you tonight. You said, well, Deborah, that abortion was 15 years ago. I, I'm, I'm over it. I'm not saying that you've been crying every day about it. But if you never repented of it, I'm sure that there is some spirit that has attached itself mm -hmm. to you with that. And so uh, we want to give you the opportunity to repent. We want to give you the opportunity to experience God's favor and his grace so that whatever attached itself to that emotion or whatever attached itself to your family, OK, because when those spirits come in, maybe it was not you that had an abortion. Maybe it was your mama. Maybe it was your auntie, somebody in your bloodline where this spirit said, hey, I'm going to come in and I'm going to attack this whole family. And so the the most lethal attacks from the enemy are those that are the most subtle. 
Mm because they don't look like it's evil. It doesn't look like it's evil. He's just coming in. It doesn't look like it's evil. And so you would not attribute it to being something that was connected to an abortion. You had an abortion that somebody else had from a long time ago. And I see that we are running out of time. My goodness. Uh, The other thing that I wanted to touch on tonight was uh, forgiveness. Um, but let me get this with shame. It says, given that shame can lead us to feel as though our whole self is flawed, bad, and subject to exclusion. Isn't that something? Shame can make you think that you will never be righteous, that everything everything that's negative that happens to you you'll start connecting it back to that see if i if i just yeah. hadn't had that abortion see if i you know i would have some food today if i hadn't had that abortion see i would be married today if i didn't have that abortion see i would have a house today if i didn't have that abortion yeah. see i would have a good job today if i didn't have that abortion because the enemy wants to torment you like that that's condemnation god is saying come to me tell me what you did ask me to forgive you and i'm going to do it if you come with a real mm-hmm. heart And you said, well, what about if I've had multiple abortions? Then that means that there is something in your soul that God has got to fix. And he's the only one that can fix it. Mm -hmm. And whether you have had one abortion or 20, God wants to fix you. He wants to heal you. He wants to deal with the root of that thing that caused you to feel like I'm just going to get so, um, so what's the word? Um, Numb. I'm going to become so numb to this that I won't even think about what I'm doing. I'm just going to do it. 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 I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so you keep on doing it. But God wants you to feel. He wants you to feel. He wants you to feel. He doesn't want you to become numb. He doesn't want that to become part of something that you just do. God wants you to feel. OK, he not only wants you to feel his love, sometimes he, he wants us to feel the pain of what we do. There is something um, I saw somebody sent it to me um, on Facebook. And I tell you, I said, I hope I can always find it because it really made me laugh. And it was a little girl who looked like she might have been two years old, probably not more than three. And she had painted up the bathroom. The bathroom was white. She had colors on the counter, the toilet, the shower, Mm -hmm. the tub, everywhere. And so when her mother, and it never shows the mother because the mother has a camera uh, videotaping it. And when the mother opens the bathroom door, the little girls start start sniffing and then she passes out. (laughs) She She says, if I think, mama not gonna whoop me (laughs) let me just go ahead and do this because i don't want to feel nothing well god doesn't want us to faint he doesn't want us to faint the scripture tells us you know not to faint not to be weary not to be weary don't faint don't be weary god loves you too much he loves you too much and he has a plan for your life he has a purpose for your life and he wants to restore you he wants to forgive you he wants to make you whole he wants you to be able to talk about it we know that you know there's only so much that we can do in this hour Mm -hmm. that we have and we lost a few minutes with the technical stuff there's only so much that we can do but you can always connect with us i'm pretty sure it's going to be a mama trauma for and we're going to follow up with some of this because you know this is a heavy topic right now this is a heavy topic and we don't want you to feel condemned we want you to forgive yourself we want you to forgive yourself forgiveness can be defined as a conscious decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or a group of people who harmed you or even against yourself giving yourself the permission to go on and then self-loving self-love your you gotta it's gotta be self-loving you got to be like i you know i did it okay and 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 i'm sorry and because you can't go back and undo it you can't have a changed behavior yeah Uh, don't don't do it again isn't that what Mm -hmm. jesus said listen i'm gonna heal you but go that's what he told the, the prostitute go don't do it no more don't do it no more Don't do it no more because what we're presenting to you is an opportunity to find, and you may be pregnant right now, or you may know somebody that's pregnant right now and they're contemplating an abortion. Tell them to call us, tell them to get in touch with us. 
you know, at least to be able to talk about it. You know, we may not be able to, to sway them, but we want to put some more information in their hands. We want to give them something to think about, some other resources, some tools, but mainly we want to introduce them to Jesus. We want to remind them of a savior that loved them so much that he went to the cross for them. Listen, we are so glad. I realize that we are out of time right now, but we will be coming back with Mama Trauma 4. And uh, we'll probably try to wrap this up before we introduce the next topic to Mama Trauma 4. And we probably will not wait until the third um, week to do this. We probably will come on before because we realize that right now we need as many soldiers on the battlefield as we can get. We need some worshipers. We need some people that's going to go before those that are going to fight with tambourines and songs and dancing. Mm -hmm. And you just might be one of them. But if depression mm -hmm. has you in lockdown, if condemnation has you in lockdown, if shame has you in lockdown, you can't beat a drum and you can't play a tambourine because the enemy does not want you to worship. He wants to make you feel condemned. He wants to make you feel useless. He wants to take your value away. He wants to steal, kill and destroy. And we're we're telling you that the, the Lord counter, countered that. He said, but I came to give you life and that more abundantly. And we Amen. want you to have the abundant life. So thank you so much for rocking with us. Thank you, Kai, for working behind the scenes to get us on here to talk tonight. As always, I thank you, LaShawn. I thank you, uh, Yvonne, for being with us tonight. And again, uh, ladies, please reach out to us through our email if you know somebody or if you need to talk or if this has blessed you tonight. How about putting up a prayer hand for us? If this has really blessed you tonight and you know that somebody needs this help, need to be healed, please, please reach out to us. We love each and every last one of you. We pray God's richest blessings be upon you, that the blessings of the Lord will chase you down and run you over. We pray that God will make the crooked places straight in your life and the rich, rich edges rough edges smooth. We pray that goodness and mercy will follow you and that you will stay in the presence of the Lord all the days of your life. In Jesus name. Amen. Thank amen. you all.